All right. Hi, everyone. This is Faye from Face World Media. And here with me today for my podcast is Allison Cheston. Allison. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so good to be here. Oh, so good to have you here, Allison. And for my audience who don't know yet, you know you very well, I want to just do a brief intro okay. and we're going to take the conversations to many different corners of uh, topics, careers, and beyond careers. So, here we go. Uh, for those of you who are meeting Allison for the first time, in the past 16 years, Allison Cheston has served as a trusted advisor and guide to thousands of executives and young adults as they navigate the course of their careers. Employing a marketing framework and a deep course of inquiry, Allison helps clients define their long-term goals and framework for success, translating disparate ideas into powerful narratives that grounds them as they venture forth into new careers, new businesses, and new life plans. She works with them to identify their unique value in the marketplace and their right direction provides the tools they need to promote themselves effectively, either internally at their current organization or with prospective employers or partners, and then helps them pivot to the next phase. And most importantly, uh, with Allison's vision, you know, Allison has just launched an online course called the ultimate course for getting a job in your twenties. That's very, very exciting. And we have included links for you to explore Allison's website and also the new course in the description. So make sure to check it out. Welcome Allison. So throw you're here. Thank you, Faye. Thank you for that introduction. Sounds very familiar. <laughs> you are very welcome. I feel like I can, the way that I've been talking about you, Allison, which is very different than your bio is that number one, it, it's funny. I always tell people how much I enjoy working with you. Um, and thank you. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, it's hard. I feel like that sounds like an easy and kind of plain statement, but it really means a lot. I feel like, you know, we've gotten to know each other since or during the pandemic in 2020. And in the past few months, since we started working together, I really got to know you. And I feel like I trust you the same way you trust me. We can be so transparent with each other about feedback, how to grow someone else's career. And um, that has been fantastic. So I'm going to shut up for a moment and ask you a question first. I um, love it. Thank you. And thank you for saying that, Faye. That it means a lot to me too. I've really, really enjoyed the process that we've gone through to develop this course. And it's as you know, it's my first one. Couldn't have done it without you, seriously. As I've told you many times. Yeah, as I've told other people many times yeah. to help you reach your first because um, you know, together we're so excited about the content, but please maybe share with us first about why, you know, after 16 years and you're very successful at your career, you have ongoing clients and a number of them, um, but why creating this course and what was the motivation to do mm. this extra work? So it, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so back in 2008, when I had, I had been practicing, um, I had my business for a couple of years. I went out full throttle on my own. I left my job and I just hung out my shingle and the financial crisis hit. And so I had a lot of work, but I couldn't find any paying clients. So I really decided I was going to devote that sort of year, it turned out to be a little longer, but around a year um, to focusing on younger people and their career trajectories and how they got their start. And the, the impetus for me was really, I've always sort of followed my own kids. You know, they're now in their mid and late twenties. Um, at the time, my first child was just, you know, I think he was in ninth grade and he was just sort of thinking about the kinds of things he was interested in. And I, I found that very exciting, very stimulating. I was surrounded by so many people who were struggling with what they would do next. You know, people who, for example, had been working for 25 years and, you know, print magazines and and the whole industry was cratering because the internet had you know become the main thing and they were totally unprepared for the the turndown and in, in you know in, in the crisis and and so there was something so hopeful and so optimistic about working with younger people and millennials who were just getting started and 
had sort of this wide-eyed optimism about what they might want to do. So I decided to dedicate that year to a project where I would interview, and I ended up interviewing a couple of hundred people who were millennials who were already in their late 20s, had already been in their careers. I wanted to understand what their trajectories had looked like, what their motivations had been, what kind of education and experience and background they each had, and then kind of put together a prospectus and a point of view about that world. And my plan originally was to write a book that didn't end up happening um, for a number of reasons. But what it did was it launched me into this whole area where I developed this, this very specific expertise in helping people in their 20s. And so now I get so many referrals. You know, a lot of parents come to me on, for their kids. I get um, a lot of, unfortunately, I get a lot of referrals from the mental health community who are treating people in their 20s who have a lot of anxiety and depression, unfortunately, as we all know. Um, and, and so over the years, this has been a real mainstay of my business. So usually, you know, I have, I work with up to say 20 people at a time, but usually around half of those people are in their 20s. Maybe they're just about to graduate and they're freaking out and they have no idea what they want to do. Maybe they've tried to find a job and they've been unsuccessful. Certainly during COVID, um, it's been very difficult for new grads. People who graduated in, the, in 2020 and 2021 were, were hit with a terrible job market. They could not get find any footing. So parents will often contact me um, on behalf of their kids or the kids will contact me and their parents will help them to, you know, to pay for it. One of the things that I found is that while I love doing my work one-on-one -on -one with people and the process that we go through is very intimate, very intense, and thankfully very successful, I also talk to a lot of people who can't afford to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. And so it has been my goal for honestly, like the last five years to develop an online course where I could bring everything that I do to bear on, you know, on a course, I can help more people. I can get the word out there. It's affordable. It certainly requires plenty of work, you know, but if you're willing to do the work, it, you will succeed. So when I found you, I was so grateful because I did try, and I've told you this, I did try to do this by myself and I couldn't, I could not. I, it was, it was just it, too, there were too many pieces that, you know, it was like there was a comfort level that I needed help with. So I'm eternally grateful and I'm very excited that we have this content and it's all done and ready to go. Absolutely. And Allison, before my next question, I'm going to ask you to move your camera down a little bit more. Okay. So you're showing more of your upper body, okay. like the way I am positioned. Yes. Oh, and you look at the lovely jacket. You have oh, thank on. you. It looks very like um, Tahari. Um, you know where it's actually from Boston. Ooh. I bought it years ago, right near you in Boston at a store that doesn't exist anymore, sadly. It was on Brattle Street and it closed. It was called Sete Bello. It was a beautiful store oh. right next to the uh, LA Burdick store. Do you know where that is on Brattle? Oh my, <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I... LA Burdick is literally my favorite chocolate. It's such a, you have to indulge yourself in that. It's a quite pricey, I have to admit, but whenever mm. I want to send a special gift, yep. I go to literally yep. regular there. My husband's obsessed with it. He still gets gifts from there. We, we, he buys it, you know, online. Yeah. We love uh, that store. It's a beautiful store. Oh, what are the chances their specialty uh, little chocolate mice. It's like, you don't oh, no. know. Oh my God. Yeah, I can't, we never talked about this. How, I know. I know. How do we like the same food. It's, <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. Hand yeah. dipped chocolate with a little tail and that people are like, so I feel beautiful. bad for eating it. Then I don't anymore after I actually eat them. And oh, I know. I know. They're so good. Their chocolate is fantastic. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, so that's where I got the jacket. <laughs> that was oh. a long time ago. 
Wow, I like it. It suits you. It it's like so minimum and it's streamlined and it's just it, it works out great. Oh my goodness, I just okay. that was such a uh, exciting turn that I didn't quite expect. But um, <laughs> <laughs> look how much fun we're having. I actually really like to have fun during. I I think I sound a little serious when we first oh. kicked off and um, yeah, of but, course. But one thing, the uh, very also, serious topic. Very yeah, if your chocolate's very serious. But you know, careers, when it comes to careers, I still remember now being, you know, approaching my late 30s. Oh, my goodness. I remember the stress that I went through um, as an immigrant, as an Asian immigrant um, in my, not just my 20s. I remember the anxiety was, uh, it was very much accumulating when I was 19, 20. And yeah. I had wished at one point I was one of those cool kids, just l let life happen to them. I couldn't. I was very much like, Give me the structure. Do I have the right internships? And you can literally drive yourself pretty crazy on, on some days. And I, I want to kind of just confront mm. that and and appreciate Gosh. you for being in that space because there are plenty of executives who very much focus on people uh, much later in their in, in people's careers. So could you maybe share some of the insight that you have uncovered and realized that most parents don't um, about their children? like you get to know about what their real struggles are. So it's interesting. I, I was just, um, before we, we did this, I was just meeting with a client of mine who's in her 20s who has ADHD. That, I have to say, is a rampant problem. And even if people don't have ADHD, which you know, causes a lot of problems with focus, focus is an issue. And, and I think um, beyond you know clinically, a clinical issue it's it's one of there is so much out there there are so many different types of opportunities that exist and i think it's very confusing for people at all stages but really when they're starting out it's so overwhelming to think about what the opportunities might look like and i i think that you know in, the, in this country, we major in things, right? And a major is essentially a small amount of coursework that's established in a particular area. It doesn't make you an expert in any particular space. Mm -hmm. Unlike, you know, in European countries, when you, when, you re, when you take a course, when you major, but it's not called a major, when you concentrate in an area, Oh, that's all you that's all you do the whole time so when people graduate they they don't quite know how to how to funnel what they've learned how to channel it into a career they don't understand sort of the building blocks of i've studied this i have a little bit of knowledge of this i have an interest in this area so then what can i do with those things if you're an engineering student, you know, if you studied software engineering, no problem. If you want to be a doctor or if you want to be a clinical psychologist, these are very well-trodden paths and everybody can advise you. They know exactly like you have to do this, this, and this. But if you're an English major or history major, or you have an interest in archaeology, there are so many different possibilities, right? So, so I think a lot of times parents can't be that helpful because they're in professions. You know, I, I have a lot of, a lot of clients whose parents are doctors, for example, that's all they know. You know, they were on a path and it was just full speed ahead. So I, I think helping people to make the connection between what their interests are, what gets them excited, even something that they haven't studied, but maybe they, had a hobby or they were, you know, in some kind of um, an ensemble or um, in their spare time, they were volunteering on a farm. Like there are so many interests that sort of pop up. And if you really start talking to people, you can tease out the things that get them excited. And honestly, there's a career in everything. Like there, you have an interest, there's a career attached to it. Mm. So I, I feel like what I'm good at is sort of getting to know my clients and really harnessing the, the all of the bits and pieces of who they are and what they love, and then helping them find a path forward to do that professionally. 
And sometimes it's just about getting your first job so you could have some experience because God knows, like, you're not going to know anything if you don't get that first experience. And I do see people who have struggled to get internships or they didn't even try and then they end up working in restaurants and then they end up, they graduate and they don't have any job experience on their resumes. And that that's pretty tough. Like you really do need to have that foundational internship in order to move into the more professional world. Mm -hmm. Working with you closely on this course really helped me realize a lot of things I frankly didn't know because mm -hmm. Um, you know, over the years, I casually helped and advised people on their careers, um, whether they're many, uh, many of my friends, you know, um, as you know, a lot of my friends are a little bit older than I am. They have kids who are teenagers and entering to college or just recently graduated and they go talk to Faye and have a phone call. And, <laughs> you know, I didn't really have much structure until I saw your course and to tease out a couple of modules from the very beginning. It's about people always say, develop your vision own your vision but how and you have this process of uh defining designing or defining your vision to understand what what does that even mean and then you develop that it's i really like that approach of getting to know you yourself first as mm -hmm. trivial as it sounds i frankly didn't realize who exactly i was until i was in my 30s and i you know i, I thought i had a very clear vision of who i was by the time i was 18 19 i didn't and I didn't know, like you said, what's actually out there. And um, could you maybe talk to us a little bit about that defining and then developing the vision? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So so to your point, I think there's, there's a certain amount of excavation that has to happen. Mm -hmm. And when I meet with people, you know, I ask them to talk to me about their personal history all the way back to like middle school. And they're usually they're surprised because they, they just want to tell me about their recent experience. But there's often, there are kernels of interest that pop up early on. Sometimes we forget about them. Sometimes we go back to them and sometimes we just say, you know, goodbye forever. Or maybe they pop up later when, you know, we're in much later life. But but those um, those are clues, you know, it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like being a little bit of a detective to kind of understand, you know, who you are, like, what do you really care about, you know, and values, personal values are a huge part of how I help people to realize their vision of what they want to do. I, I think um, in today's environment, much more than when I was growing up, there's this idea that you should be able to have impact in your career. And that you know seems to be much more important to people than money. So, um, so, so when I work with someone, I really want to understand like, is that real? Like, is is there a real interest in you know saving the environment, or is that something that you kind of feel like you should be doing? You know, there there are there are lots of um, there are lots of there's lots of nuance across across that spectrum of interest. So whether it's a real interest, whether it's something that you wish you had pursued, um, going back to this client today, I was we we had already worked on her resume, and she's in the process of applying to grad school. And she started talking about some volunteer experience that she had done for like a year that was really interesting and re would really help in her application to business school. And I said, you, you never told me about that. Like that, that's so important, you know? So I think sometimes people forget, they, they don't think it's, it's critical. Um, so it, it's, helping, it's helping my clients to understand what might be important. And then little by little building, like putting together the building blocks so that there is a vision in place whether it actually ends up being exactly as you expected, it probably won't be, you know, that it's just not life. I, I don't personally believe that there's like a dream job. I think a dream job is, is really a misnomer. I think it's like very trumped up. Uh, I think people really should look for a good job that, that ticks certain boxes and get some learning you know, before you, you worry so much about whether it's going to be a dream job.
So did that answer your question a bit up on the, on the, the vision piece? Yes, for sure. For sure. And um, one of the things that you always urge your students to do, whether it's people working with you, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one or in your course, I like the homework section and I don't want to, it's not even called homework. It's basically worksheets that people can pick up and frankly, they could do any portions of it. Obviously it will be great if they actually take the time to finish it. But the way I look at the content is like, even if I just ask myself two out of the 10 questions, I will still be a number of steps ahead of where I was before. And I like the approach of thinking that like, I think the way that we were brought up or the way I was brought up is you want to go after the number one, the best of everything. And frankly, that has really, you know, did me some disservice or like be really became a detriment of finding the best job, the dream job, the perfect partner that, yeah, there's no yeah. such thing. That's exactly right. There are compromises with everything. Mm -hmm. And and honestly, I think that does stymie people because they they want to make sure it's the exact perfect opportunity before they, they pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. It makes them so anxious to have to make that decision. But honestly, it's really more about just getting some experience and little by little you iterate. You know, life is all about iterating, right, Faye? I mean, you and I have talked about this. It's I definitely not about like getting it right, right out of the box. Yeah. And, and if you, you know, perfectionism is the, you know, is the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Like, how do you get things done if you're so worried about making everything perfect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that's another, that that's something I grapple with a lot is, you know, it's a lot, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear. Um, mm -hmm and and a lot of a lack of confidence oh my god that is a huge that is a huge piece of of this work that that i do with my clients mm -hmm. i would say every stage of the game it's it's shocking to me how many people i work with who are you know have been working for many years mm -hmm. who actually still really lack confidence and so everybody has the same issues. You know, we all are walking around thinking that other people have it together and we don't. And people go on LinkedIn and they worry, you know, how do I measure up to my peers? My, everybody looks like they're doing so well. You know, what about me? Yeah. Oh, that's, isn't that interesting? You yeah. talk about LinkedIn because oh, I yeah. used to uh, right, compare myself with someone else my age younger who are oh now a director at age 25 and later you find out that oh everybody's the director in that little small exactly. marketing agency yeah, exactly right and so yeah, or they got fired you know and for <laughs> yeah they got fired and they now have to go back to an associate level exactly um, <laughs> and it's so true and just like chatting with you Allison like I, I yeah I'm not someone in my 20s anymore but I can imagine it's you're way more than the sounding board and someone who actually gets it as opposed to uh you have to somehow sugarcoat it or you have to read some article to say oh you know earlier today i read this and therefore you should do that and it's very irritating to kids who are living <laughs> in it so uh, you know one thing that always comes up and it's a challenging one is how yeah. do people find their first job and yeah. I, you know, people have approached me, whether they're 18, whether they're 22 out of college, there are people who ask me those questions when they um, have graduated from graduate school or have had work experience, but now they're pivoting to another career. So I bet they're probably different answers, but in general, how do you approach someone who doesn't really feel very confident and it's, you know, it, out there looking for their first job? Yeah, actually, uh, I mean, I, I think there's an answer to both of those that's that's pretty similar. And it's go to your network. And if when you are first graduating from college, you don't have a big network per se. But I think people discount the people who they actually know, who they can build on. So for example, you know, again, like LinkedIn is such a great tool for this sort of thing. Forget, you know, forget getting a job through LinkedIn just in terms of building a network between your friends, your classmates, people you went to high school with, your parents' friends, your professors, mm -hmm. anyone you've, you know, you've, you've dealt with over the transom, maybe you worked in a restaurant and you had a boss. Those people are all part of a big network. Mm -hmm. And little by little, you grow a network. Now, when you're just starting out, 
I believe that the most important first step is to make sure that you know what your direction is. A lot of a lot of clients come to me and they say, you know, I'm open. I'm, you know, I'm open. I'm whatever seems like a good, you know, seems like a good idea. Sure. I don't believe in being open. I believe in being directed. So you really want to be able to clue people into what your what your focus is because just being open is not doesn't convey any kind of passionate attachment to that area. What does is if you research some ideas and you're moving very specifically toward a, a, a role, an organization, or a particular role in a particular organization, like those are all really important things. You're much more liable to convince somebody that you would be able to be successful in that job if you really care about that place and you know something about it and you already have an idea of what the role is. You've looked through job descriptions. You understand what this position entails. You, are, you can pinpoint exactly how you would do that job, why you would be good at it, and you can articulate why. If you can do those things, you will get a job. It's at, at that point, it's a numbers game. So at that point, then you go out and you start telling everybody, hey, I'm looking for these three roles at these 10 organizations. Do you know anyone I can speak with? You go on LinkedIn, you see, oh, um, a friend of mine knows someone who works at X organization. I'm wondering, can they make an introduction? Today, what's one of the great things is that uh, people who employees get paid for referrals. So if I work at a tech company and I refer my friend or my friend of a friend, I get, I get, I get quite a nice little you know, stipend for that. So it's really worth contacting those people. They'll be thrilled to talk to you because they might get paid. I mean, honestly, like if you just think about it from just a like very basic standpoint, they'll be motivated to talk to you. But your classmates, people, the alums from your college, they, they are ready and waiting to be helpful. You're a young person who's recently graduated. That's great currency. Everyone wants to help you. So take advantage of it. Very true. I, um, Allison, on, the, on that note, I, I just have a sense of like one of the things, one of the many things you enjoy, excuse me, your, your career and what you have accomplished so far is that I think you very much enjoy helping these people who like in their 20s some are finding their way some may be desperate and really struggling at the moment and i think you you nailed it most of us yeah not every single one of us want to be of contribution to to someone else and i have to say as someone uh who has received whether emails or calls to say fey where can i I need help. My kids need help. And now I know who to direct them to, which is really convenient. And um, but even back then, I always felt like a sense of, you know, like for people who are listening to be like, I don't want to trouble anyone. I'm exactly. I be independent. Right. It's it's really not true that people will hate it if you ask them. It's not true. They want to help you they want to direct you to somewhere else and uh, someone else who could be more resourceful more experienced uh, but i've never been never felt bothered once not just me i know a lot of people yeah in my network have received similar requests and everybody's very willing to help so don't it's true yeah. and not, not only willing but they welcome it yeah i mean just think about like going through your day Somebody taps you and says, you know, could you help like my, my son's friend really, you know, is interested in, in content production. Um, you know, he has this ed education and whatever. I mean, it's a great joy for someone like you to be able to help that person. And mo I think most adults feel that, you know, we all can relate to new grads and what, what it felt like not knowing our direction and everybody wants to be helpful. So this is a great moment in, you know, especially, and when you're so young, it's a great moment to take advantage of that goodwill. It really does exist pretty universally. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, as 
as a younger person, you can be helpful to those people. You can reciprocate. One of the nice sort of leveling of the playing fields that's occurred in the last 20 years is you're a tech native, you're a digital native, and you can help people in say my generation. You could you know, help them to create a spreadsheet for a, a thing that they were working on or mm -hmm. you know, help them set up their iPad. I mean, I, seriously, like a lot of people need, need tech help. Mm -hmm. Those young people can be helpful. And you can offer, I mean, even if it's not, even if nobody ever takes you up on it, you can offer to do something for that person. So it's not, it's not that you don't have anything to share or to give just because you're starting out. You, you know, you do have a lot of expertise that older people might not have. Exactly. Just something that's so native seems easy to you doesn't yeah. necessarily mean they're easy to someone else. Totally. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, our whole family was very into Zumba to, you know, stay active. We belong <laughs> to a right, lifetime at a gym that very quickly closed. And the first thing as we're following the founder of Zumba on Beto, it was interesting. This guy, you know, all very fit and everything. I think he was only 50 years old at the time. And he said, well, I'm trying to navigate Zoom and teaching. And my, oh. uh, my nephew or niece who's 13 taught me how to do this. And here I am. And that reminded yeah. me of, that's that's huge totally millions set up, of people set up his business yeah yeah it's it's wonderful i i have to ask uh, you know uh, with your permission about your origin story allison we i feel like i sometimes uh, you know we jump right in into yeah. the things your career what makes you so known but when the moment you said oh you know the questions about when you're in middle school when you're even younger than that what were you into I wonder at this point uh, of your career, at this point of the interview, what comes to mind when it comes to your younger self that mm -hmm. may have dropped some uh, M and M's back then that have you know led you into this career, or maybe some the, the, the way that you um, live your life or or your belief systems. So, oh yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, so I'm so just to sort of piece it together. You know, when you look at when you look at my background, it looks like I had this all figured out, but it, I really didn't. Um, I, you know, way back when I was in middle school and beyond, I was obsessed with uh, languages. So I'm a linguist by, by training. And um, I, I majored in international relations and romance languages in college. And I have, an inter I have a, a master's in international education. And I've lived abroad a fair amount as a, you know, as a younger person. So my early career, I, I, did, I was basically working in international branding and marketing for a whole series of, of branding and design companies, using my languages and my cross-cultural experience and, and working for international clients. And I loved it so much. It was really exciting. But the problem for me was always that I wanted to be an expert in something. And when you're a marketer, you can sometimes get in, into a trap where you're representing other things and other people, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have expertise yourself. Mm -hmm. And this was a long time frustration of mine. What I was also really interested in, I was always fascinated by what people did in their jobs at, from a pretty young age, like starting probably in, you know, when I was in, in my late teens, I had a lot of different kinds of jobs um, I got laid off a few times and I had to look for jobs and I was a fantastic job seeker. Like I had this airtight system where I, where I would, I would get like, you know, 85% of my targets. And this was all like through the newspaper and stuff, you know, or just by meeting people and, you know, networking about 85% of the time I would, I would get an interview and I had a really high hit rate with job offers. And I knew I was onto something, but there wasn't any sort of any, any place to sort of take that. And so um, after I left the branding world, I became head of marketing for the trade association for executive search firms. And so I learned a lot about the executive search business. And I thought for a while I wanted to be a search consultant, but while I was there, I realized I was really interested in helping people figure out what they wanted to do and then help them find jobs. 
I have a, a quick question. Tell As me. You're saying that 85% closing rate is very high. Yes. And I, I, I like to believe that somehow as an immigrant, um, you know, Chinese woman that I was somehow had my little formula, but I would like to hear yours first on what do you think that may have contributed to your success back then? You might not even know it back then. Oh, I do know. I do but know. You, I can you tell you. I can tell now. <laughs> so I can tell you how I got the interview and I can tell you how I got how I got the job. Yeah. Um, and these are both things that you would never do today. Like they're they're kind of old, they're ancient. So that's fine. We can translate to some new behaviors. Today, exactly. Yeah. The way I got the interview. So I was in. I I had started my career in PR and I moved into marketing and branding. Mm -hmm. I wrote a press release about myself in the third person. Yeah. Because the I and and to translate this into like what you would do today, the idea was to show people, not to tell them that I knew how to write and promote something mm -hmm. through um, that medium. So I, I wrote a press release. I described myself, you know, with a byline like New York, you know, Allison at the time, my last name was Farber. Allison Farber, you know, is, is, is currently on the job market, um, you know, most recently with da, da, da. So I went through this whole thing as though I were writing about you know, any kind of product or service. Mm -hmm. And all I did was write a cover letter. And in addition to the cover letter, I would include this copy of my press release. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've got, I, I can't even tell you how many people I, I interviewed with. So then when I went into the interview, at the time we used to make presentations using slides. <laughs> so what are slides as in? As a slide. Slide? Like, like little, little, you know, two by two. Okay. Slide. Do you know what I'm talking about? They're, so they're, they're like, it's film, film that we're in within a little frame. Yeah. That you would project. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I remember those. Right. Yeah. Slides. So yeah. I would, and, and you would, you would have a slide tray so yeah. where you would put the slides. I put together a presentation of the work that I had done for my last employer, put in a slide tray and I would go and I would say, do you have a projector? I can share what I've been doing yeah. and I would present it. It was like a portfolio. Like they didn't even ask for it and boom, no. you got your, you got your binder and it's, everything is ready to go. Yeah. Uh, so again, the idea is to show and not, and not tell, just sh show people what you can can do because as soon as they saw me present they said oh well she's a good presenter yeah you know she's you know she put the way she put it together she's articulate she's you know very cohesive and how she she yeah. was able to um to create the presentation and i and i got many many job offers that way wow so when yeah. you mention slides okay i want to point out to people who are literally in their 20s this is, these are my top secret techniques yeah, yeah we're not i never here. talk about this <laughs> we should have a special bonus section added to your course. Exactly. Um, literally, exactly. because, yeah. you know, that, that leads into a couple of like next questions very well. But I have to say that when I remember slides being used uh, when I was in um, uh, elementary and middle school um, many years ago, our teachers had to write with a permanent marker or something, oh. right? You have to draw and articulate it. So is that how you created, what was it how you created those slides? What did you do to like? No, I, I, um, they were slides that I had put together at my previous company. Mm -hmm. So they were under the umbrella of this other company. So I was, I was explaining what I'd been working on, but it was through that company. So we, I had already worked on the presentation. So it was a combination of um, visuals like that we had put together, the designers had put together, mm -hmm. the marketing team had put together and, um, and, you know, like, a, a, like picture a PowerPoint. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah. some of the word, the wording and the descriptions of what we did, and I would just take them through the whole thought process and, and how, how the projects went. That's so fascinating to me because there's one area we really wanted to talk about and i can't believe in the past 40 minutes somehow i've learned all new things about you that we didn't get to i can't believe i'm talking about this <laughs> exactly 
But I think, again, that this leads to something, guys, for if you're listening, which is uh, motivation and, uh, and, and effort and hard work. And when I say motivation, I don't want people to think of it as, uh, I don't mean that by you need to be successful and measured by money and, and all that, you know, who are you, who are you um, willing to relentlessly convince? Like, that's not what I mean, but it's more like for you, Allison, like at a young age, you found a way of something that frankly just seemed like to be too much work no freaking way for someone else to yeah. prepare something like that and needless to say to stand up and present it that's probably something else people want to avoid on top of preparing something sure. now you have to speak to it uh, what do you mean by this but you saw this as an opportunity and through your excitement I, I believe you also enjoyed that process so could you talk a bit about motivation and and a lot of people say you know does it help people? When is it too much? When is it too too low? How can I can I motivate myself? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's such a, it's a good question. So um, so you know, I always had this intrinsic motivation. First of all, I needed to pay my rent, right? Because I didn't want to have to move back with my parents. <laughs> number one motivation. <laughs> so that was motivation number one. <laughs> and I think. You know, you're in your 20s, you're living pretty hand to mouth. It's not like you have a lot of extra laying around. So I definitely had a lot of motivation to, you know, to stay in my apartment with my roommate living in the living room, <laughs> which is all I could afford at the time. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the one of the things I see so much today is that a lot of people get a lot of help from their parents in their 20s. Um, that wasn't really the norm, you know, for my generation. Our parents were pretty much like figure it out and, you know, we we helped you with college and we're we're done. Yeah. You know, and and I think that the attitude which does not it, it it's not good for for people in their 20s necessarily, but I I think that parents help sometimes too much. They're a little too involved. Um mm you know, and in, in kind of covering for their kids and saying, don't worry, don't worry, you know, we'll, we'll help you, you know, we'll pay for it, don't worry. Um, so I definitely think that, you know, having some intrinsic motivation. Also, I do think that most people are motivated. They do want, they want to work. They, they don't want, it's very depressing, you know, to think that all your friends are out there with jobs and in, in your home and you don't know what you're doing. It, it, it's very upsetting to people. So. I think motivation is important, but direction, mm -hmm. direction is the gift. So you might be motivated, but if you don't have direction, if you haven't figured out how to like how to get from point A to point B, like you know you want a job, but you keep sending resumes and cover letters through LinkedIn and you don't get a response because mm -hmm. you don't realize that you're you're hitting the applicant track system no person is actually seeing your stuff it's so demoralizing mm -hmm. and and so having somebody guide you through that process and help you to understand exactly what's happening when you're applying and how to get through and not just assume that nobody thinks you're good you know that you're terrible you don't know what you're doing you don't have enough experience and you suck which is what most people think when they're applying online. I mean, what else, what else would they think, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that that will help motivate them and push them forward. You know, I was with the client yesterday and she said, I feel so much better now because I now like we have a plan. I know what I'm doing. You know, I have I, I wasn't sure where I was going and now I now I have a direction. So I don't think I'm going to have trouble, you know, getting the homework done for next week because now I really know what I, what I have to do. Mm -hmm. And it's so much about that. You know, our whole mentality, we're, we're built around assignments. Mm -hmm. Assignments are, are a big part of life from a very young age. Like somebody gives us homework, we have to do the homework and we have to get to the next stage. And if that motivation, that homework isn't coming from anybody it's sometimes it's hard for young people to figure out what to do next. Hmm. What an interesting conversation, because as I'm asking the question, and sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm asking this question because I sort of have answered it myself or this is really interesting. But the moment you start talking about this, I realized that I 
may not know a, a very straightforward answer for how I motivate myself or where I, where did I have a direction? Where did that direction come from? And as someone now approaching my late thirties, it's easy to look back to the past 10, 20 years to say, see here, here, here are the data points, but then it's hard to uh, pre-write that story, you know, looking into the future. And sometimes we're afraid to tell one story, tell a vision and mm. have it be changed or having to pivot. And um, so for me, I was just wondering, you know, Allison, what was it also for you as well? Like, you know, not having to move back with your parents. I think that's very <laughs> motivational. Um, you know, for me to like, oh, my parents invested so much money in my private school, going to a U.S. college. You know, I'm not originally from here. Yeah. I felt this weight on my shoulders to not have to go back so that I can get a job or at least do something here for a few years so that I can be better off when I do return back to Beijing, China. Um, and obviously I didn't end up going back and ended up continuing my career here is that I, I think to me, someone, um, I hate to admit this, but I definitely used to be and still a little bit of a high, the people say you're high achievers, but I'm more higher anxiety. I'm more, um, sometimes excitable, uh, person that, um, you know, managing my energy, my time is a big piece of it, but also as a result of that, being older now and being more self-aware, I tell myself, you know what, I want to learn something new every day. And it used to be this profound mm -hmm. thing, this article, this and that. Now I said, you know what, I'm going to try to learn how to use a liquid eyeliner or learn what HVAC means. Uh, now I have a house. I had <laughs> no idea what I'm, what that meant. I'm just like, what is HVAC? What is a heat pump? What is a, you know, to me, it's like every baby step of learning and, and bettering myself and to be able to yeah. teach that through creating YouTube videos, through, you know, working with you, Allison, like to me, that, that is a tremendous amount of successes at various levels that I, I celebrate still. So, I don't know. It, it, it helps me to continue to motivate me as opposed to, yeah. oh, that wasn't nothing that, you know, I didn't totally No, I think being a continuous learner and being curious mm -hmm. is, is so, it's so important, but it's clearly so much a part of who you are. And, you know, Faye, you have so many interests. I mean, I, as I, I pointed out to you the other day, like looking at what you have behind you, I mean, you have this, this incredible artistic vision and it's very unique, you know, that you bring that to your work. So, you know, you've got so many facets to what you do and you are such a hard worker. You work all the time from, from what I can tell. You seem like you work all the time. <laughs> I, you know? That's so but funny. It, but you, you clearly love it. You mm. clearly love it. So there's that intrinsic motivation that you have. And as you said, you know, I think coming from, you know, coming from another country and wanting to be, have everybody be proud of, of the progress that you've made and mm. make the most of what you've been given. That's a, that's a, such a big part for a lot of people. And I think that sometimes that gets lost for, you know, for those who have a lot of means and whose parents, um, throw money at things when they don't know what else to do. You know, they want to save their kids from heartbreak. Yeah. And you really can't save your kids. You have, you, you got to help them launch and give them the tools, but you really, you want to be a more of a consultant as opposed to, you know, a, a driver in their lives at a certain point. And that's going to be the quote. That's going to be a major quote. I want to pull out. You want to be a consultant and not a driver, which coming from an, I don't want to say just Asian family, Asian culture, but I've yeah. seen it very much in Hispanic cultures and Jewish cultures where yeah. Parents are literally just, they're all helicopter parents coming yeah. in, you know, we're doing this because we love you. You should, you should right. be this kind of person. Your kids should go to this kind of school. You should have accomplished these things. Here's a checklist yeah. and here's your timeline and we'll be checking in with you and help you forward. Um, and I love this direction we're going. And I realize we, we, you know, clearly Allison, we have to do this like three, four more times and it will feel very natural and casual. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, it's so much fun. fun. It's so <laughs> much fun. And you and I, you know, when the moment we started working together, there's one thing I said, well, you know, I know that maybe this is not what the first course is about, but I was just wondering about the fact of being, a, you know, a, being an immigrant, being whether you're an Asian immigrant or, or any kind of immigrant living in America, we are 
we are in competitions where well, I don't like the word competitions, but we're, yeah. we're out there looking for jobs. True. Like all the American kids and except that we don't have citizenship. Most of us don't have a green card. We don't have a lot of money, no connections or families oftentimes. Yeah. And um, our English is clearly not um, oftentimes not native. So that's immediately something that's noticeable where I think about it all all the time. You know, I'm also working in a show uh, as a parallel, like called Enable Disable, but there's certain things we talk about visible versus invisible disabilities and where how people are treated differently. But uh -huh. part of us being an immigrant is that the moment you open your mouth, even before you open your mouth, the way you dress, the way that you carry yourself, you can see people look down it's like okay all right what's you know what's going on sometimes not with everybody some people are just better making it i'm making it a little more subtle than before but yeah calculations of mm, does this person need a work visa what's mm -hmm. going on would this person fit into our culture um suspicion so suspicion suspicion yeah. yeah yeah and it's funny um it's not funny, but it's interesting. You said competition, that you're in a competition. Mm -hmm. You're also in a competition with people in your family, your relatives. What what your mother is going to say, well, what about your cousin so-and-so? You know, <laughs> she's doing this. Like, why aren't you doing that? Yeah. Right? So there's yeah. a lot of, I think, in, in many families that exists. And I certainly, you know, you would, you can speak to this better than I, but it seems like certain, especially Asian families, that's very much a, you know, a, a part of what happens, you know, this sort of internal competition. It's not mm -hmm. just about the external competition. So that's, it's a lot, it's a lot to grapple with. It, you know, you're, it really you're, is you're a trying lot. to fit in and, and, you know, just be considered an, a, you know, an American mm -hmm. and you're right. There are so many hurdles. Um, but some of, but when I work with people who either are first generation or maybe came here as a child, I have a, a, a pro bono client who I've been working with again, or I have, I've been helping over the years and she's incredible. You know, she came here from Mexico when she was three, she ended up getting a free ride to college, um, helped her parents get buy a house. Like mm. they, they really couldn't speak English very well. And she's, she has so many talents, mm -hmm. but her Achilles heel has been that she's gotten very good jobs that pay very well. Mm -hmm. Now she's 27. She has, a, she has some kind of a learning issue that has been, uh, that has gone undiagnosed. And I said to her, you've got to get a, a neuropsych evaluation to deal with this mm -hmm. because it's going to follow you your whole life. And you, you have achieved so much. I mean, she's remarkable. Mm. And um, yeah, so there's like, there are all kinds of, all kinds of ways to do it. But I just, I, I feel like so many people who were born here and whose parents have, a, you know, have a lot of means who coddle them I mean, there's just not that much to admire in that picture. Mm -hmm. And they know it, you know, they don't want They don't want to be that person who is so spoiled. Yeah, it's very true. Because mm -hmm. we're, you know, we, we there's a there's certain level of content, you know, self awareness and uh, yeah. that we can, you know, hide it or lie about it. But ultimately, you know, it, it's there. And I agree with you that I have personally witnessed in recent years of people in their well into their 20s, not someone who's 21, 22, but late 20s who very much rely on the, rely on their parents using their parents' credit card. And um, there's a whole movement of a lot of young kids these days, you know, uh, also uh, becoming coaches or experts in certain fields with no experience and which- Oh my God, tell me about that annoys the sh are we, are, are, I think we're done with our, with our, with our, um, this is, this is no longer part of the session, right? Yeah, you, <laughs> no, please share your opinion. <laughs> I think it might make sense, frankly, uh, Alison. I, I love your honesty because so, you know, yes, we can make it about rainbows and unicorns, but it's really not. There's certain, yeah. there's that fine line. It's sometimes hard to draw. I, you know, I agree. It's like, when do you work too hard versus not enough when do you when should you manifest the things that you want versus you need to get off your butt and actually do the work or yeah. 
this isn't working and you know like people are not confronting like this generation anymore because everybody is like very fragile and like you know we're supposed to talk to each other in a very um i don't know like politically correct way yeah. don't trigger don't, don't trigger, trigger anything. anything don't yeah. trigger i think we've crossed that line uh yeah. a long time yeah. ago so on monday thank you say that was that was great it was really fun oh, it was so lovely so lovely